This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geek show number 396, recorded on March 28th, 2019. Here on Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way in your home news, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Pallison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios without Mike Weger tonight. Mike is not feeling well, so we've given him the night off. Of course, we'll post the show, world-class show notes. Tonight, I don't know. We're going to talk a lot of Microsoft stuff. There may be a few notes, but of course, you can head out there if you want to get any of the links available uh, out at the Average Guy. TV. You can also join us live on our mobile app. Don't forget about that. HomeGadgetGeeks.com. Easiest way to listen on the road. Streams really, really well. We thank our Patreon subscribers for doing that for us. HomeGadgetGeeks.com. Android, iPhone, available, downloaded, is free. Thank you, Patreon subscribers, for doing that as well. If you want to join us in the freshly minted, I'm looking this way because that's where it's at on my computer here, the freshly minted Discord group. If you want to join us out there, the AverageGuy.tv slash Discord. I think I had 10 or 10 or so of you join after last week's show. We've been doing it for three or four weeks. Lots of great conversation. Lots of great home automation conversation. The Unraid conversation that we had two or three weeks ago, it was super popular, has moved out there as well. Lots of great conversation going in Discord. For those of you who had never joined Facebook, this is your chance to join us in maybe the most non-Facebook thing that can exist. And that is Discord. The average guy.tv slash Discord will get you there as well. Rich and Ari's buddy, Dave McCabe, big thanks to him. He was on last week, kind of an MVP cycle we're going through yeah. here. Rich A is with us tonight. Rich is, of course, is Microsoft MVP uh, as well. Fresh off the summit, Rich yep. does a, a podcast over at windowsobserver.com. And is it IT Pro Today? IT Pro Today.com. Dot com yep. as well. That's he my day job. There. Rich is on uh, all the time with us and a good friend of the show. Rich, welcome to Home Gadget Geeks. Good to be here, Jim. Good oh, to be good, here. Good to have you. Missed you guys at Summit, though. I got to tell you, man, that was kind of uh, different this year, not uh, having you guys around. Yeah, Dave and I talked a little bit about that. That was a tough decision to... I bet. It, both of us kind of came at it from like, you know, we're just not giving it as much as we felt we should. You are so, like, you're so perfect in that. You're always... Uh, <laughs> And not to open fresh wounds, but you're always tweeting Microsoft stuff. You're always What's spending... tweeting. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe we'll talk about that towards yeah. the end of the show. Right. Um, but you're you're an enthusiast. You're always in. You're 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 um, tracking uh, the 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 builds. You're spending time like you're. That's really a great program for you, and I'm super glad that you're doing it. Dave and I both kind of felt like yeah, it's time to open up some space for some other MVPs. So I did, uh, uh, as, as with you, I missed seeing you. Uh, that's, we've, we've hung out together the last couple summits in a row and, uh, and it was so kind of a bummer. I am next week, if you're a regular listener to the show, no show, no live show next Thursday and no show. I'll be in New Orleans for a, a STEM, uh, Omaha STEM conference. We're going down there while well, I'm going on behalf of the Omaha STEM community here. So no show next Thursday will be out. Uh, but Rich, thanks for coming. We need to do yep. a little bit of an unboxing or maybe what we call an en an unenveloping. That's what we do. So, <laughs> so Ron, you know, Ron, he's out there in the chat room all the time. Ron sent me a little gift uh, during the week. I'll read the letter to you. So Ron, thanks for doing what you did here. He says, I'm sending you the three prototypes of the coins I've been working on. Uh, the first one is all green. Second one uh, is with the names. Uh, and the third is a new master with a few tweaks and a big one. Uh, well, for you to keep on display, look at it as a rare one. Hope you enjoy them as much as I enjoyed making some. Rich, this is super cool. First of all, I don't know which is first and which is second is third, but I'll just bring these out. So Ron 3D printed. Let's see if I can do it this way. Little lights on there. Ron made these 3D printed. Uh -huh. Home Gadget Geeks logo, so a little coin. It's just the, the 3D print, so that's super cool. That's a nice little Home Gadget Geeks. Very. And then um, this one, a little bit smaller. This one's going to be hard to see. A little bit smaller on that. The edges, though, have, uh, it says the average guy.tv along the edges. You probably can't see that, but I can see yeah, it. See. And then it says Jim and Mike. It's got the logo on it, the average guy.tv. So Ron, super cool. That's another one, another little coin. We got two that two more that are in here. This one, plain green, maybe a little easier to see in the light that way. So okay, a little yeah. little logo there. And that's pretty cool. I think Ron said these take 
maybe an hour to print on a 3D printer. Wow. And then this is a cool one. He sent me a picture of this one. Uh, you can hold on. Uh, Alexa. No. Uh, what's her name? Echo. <laughs> Turn off the studio lights. So let's see. Maybe okay. that. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah, maybe that, that helps. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Darkens that a little bit. So you can see there's the, the logo, you know, so the logo on the front. And then he's printed on the edge there, the little average guy logo that's on the side. So, Ron, oh, yeah. thanks thanks for doing that. A really nice hero. Echo, turn the studio lights back on for me, please. See if she'll do that. Echo, turn on the studio lights. All it is is blue there. There okay. we go. So, um, Ron, thank you for sending those a super cool. I need to, maybe here, I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll put this, we'll take this one. Set that. Set. Can you see that back there? Is my you head? Can certainly see it, but right there. Not, yeah, it's not clear. But you can mm. see there's something greenish. Trying, you know. Yeah, the lights. And... The uh, the filament that they use is kind of shiny, and so mm. it re it reacts to the lights, um, that are there. But uh, Ron, thanks for doing that. Really cool to get that. We'll have to figure out some way, maybe make these available for a fee where folks can buy them, and like, especially this one. This one's. This one's super cool. It's just a little little average guy. I don't know if if people folks would like to have these, but we'll figure out something. Ron, thanks for sending them in. So I appreciate that. Rich, um, let's talk a little bit about summit for you. What do you think? Okay. What What do you take away when you when you go to a summit like that? What do, What do you take away? What are some of your takeaways that you can talk about? I know you can't talk about right. it. Right. What are your um, takeaways? Well, the the key thing to understand about summit, of course, is. Uh, the, the reason they invite us out there is to interact and hear from the product teams. And of course, everything's, and, and I don't say this to brag, everything's under non-disclosure agreement, right? So most everything, probably 90% of the content we get in the room is, is non-disclosure. So we have to, it, it can't leave the room either. So it, it's kind of, um, it, it's kind of a situation where it's really cool to hear that stuff. And I would love to talk in detail about what I heard, but of course we can't. Now, what I wrote uh, earlier this week on my site about Summit to kind of summarize Summit was, first off, I, I think I commented, we, we may have talked about this, shortly after Satya Nadella became CEO, we had our first Summit that fall. So he became CEO in February. We had, our, I think it was our last fall Summit was that fall you could feel a difference on campus and around the employees and people we interact with a lot, the softies, that that things had changed. And I think it's just progressively gotten better over time, right? As things become more focused and all that. And, and, and Satya has certainly had a significant uh, impact on the company, N not just from a stock price level, right? That's all good too. Believe me, investors love that stuff. But the, the bigger challenge is making hard decisions, making cuts, you know, and that impacts people. And I think Satya Nadella gets that. There's a lot of people out there in the world that see, think Satya Nadella is anti-consumer or that Microsoft has become anti-consumer. And, and there's some there's some reality to that, I think, because there's but that's kind of been they've been cutting away a lot of excess, I think, getting rid of programs that are costing money that aren't profitable that aren't you know and and enthusiasts and fans on the other end of decisions like ending windows phone or windows 10 mobile see it from that perspective right they don't and they believe a company should just keep doing it because we like it and, and that it's okay to like stuff it's okay you know to to be enthusiastic about hardware and stuff but understand companies ultimately have a, a task at hand and that's to be profitable, that's to be efficient and all that kind of stuff. So I can tell you the folks that we heard from over those three days, man, they are working on some stuff they're excited about. I think when people see it, they're going to be excited. Um, it, it, and it's there's some really cool stuff going on at Redmond. Yeah. Really good. Beyond the the whole tearing down the original buildings and building new stuff. Had that started? Have they started? That they have, yeah. Okay. They actually, yeah. in the visitor center, they've opened up. Now, you guys won't have known this store. But basically, they took the old employee store they called it the company store remember it had that little room with the the turnstiles you had to go mm -hmm. past and show your thing to get mm -hmm. in right that's mm -hmm. where they had all the discounted mm -hmm. stuff now it looks like a big microsoft store a retail microsoft store so everything's out on the shelves there is no secret back room that you have to get a pass to but 
when you go up to the checkout, you've got to validate who you are in order to get the proper discounts. And it, it's like a Microsoft store. So stuff on display, hardware, software, the whole kit and caboodle, plus all the logo stuff. And yeah. then the visitor center across the way, they've got a massive picture, a model of campus and with a light showing what they're working on for this phase that they're replacing the original X buildings, you know, the ones that were cross shaped. Apparently Lake Bill is not going anywhere that if you don't know about Lake Bill, Lake Bill is a little pond. Uh, we call them retention ponds down here in Florida in between those original buildings and they named it Lake Bill. And so that's still going to be there. It's not going away, but everybody was a little freaked out that it might, but, but yeah, so I, I didn't even, we saw construction uh, the state of Washington is building light rail stations that are going to come across um, that area and drop off in at Microsoft and uh, another place nearby. And that's going to connect from SeaTac. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a ability to go light rail all the way around to Microsoft. Yeah, that would really help. I'm not sure yep. that helps the commuter, you know, the commute situation there as much as it does. I mean, it's super convenient if you're coming to Microsoft, you can get off the plane, get on the light rail, get right into Microsoft. Yep. It's a little messy today to get that done. Yeah. I'm in Seattle. I kind of, I figured out the bus system. And so oftentimes I'd go from SeaTac, jump on a bus. I'd, that's the way I'd to take, do it though, too. If you've got the time, that's yeah. definitely only a few bucks. Yeah. You know, a few bucks and a few hours. The same way. Yeah. A <laughs> yeah. few depending on the timing. Um, I'm just trying to keep up with the guys. Do they no. still have retail boxed office? No, they actually have codes they sell for all. So in the, in the employee store, in the store on campus, they sell, um, Cards, just like you find in a Microsoft store for Office or for, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess they do sell the OS ones too. Now, employees get a pretty sweet discount on software. It's 80%. Wow. So they only pay, uh, for a $100 Office home for a year, they pay 20 bucks. Wow. Luckily at Summit, we get an opportunity to take advantage of that with a cap. Uh, with our own money. And so I always stock up and have a little bit stack up to have onto my Xbox Live, my Xbox Game Pass and, and Office Home, Office 365 Home. So that, and they got they had some pretty good hardware prices. But again, we don't have we we didn't have the amount of money in our past to be able to really spend that. Yeah, so. no, it's it's always I think for me, the best time was just spending time in Seattle. That's always yeah, yeah. a super, super cool town. Yeah. Do you think um, when uh, last year, years I've been there, we spent a lot of time or I spent a lot of time going to kind of the surface related topics that we had. Did they did they have some of those? They did. And you get a yep. feel for I mean, they're still committed to this. This but Absolutely. Right? They're not going anywhere with surface. I didn't go into any sessions with surface. Um, I did go into um, some enterprise stuff, uh, but. Hardware wise, yes, I, I don't think anything's changing there. I think Microsoft has established themselves with the Surface as a very good OEM from that perspective. They're certainly making some efforts here late in the stage of Windows 7, the way they're kind of communicating where they're at. You go to look at the Windows 7 in the lifecycle page, it points you towards, you know, the better experience today is going to be buying a new computer, getting Windows 10 that way. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the age of Windows 7, and you go back, you know, so nine years ago, right? 2009, I think it was. The technology of those days is 10 years old. You know, I, we, I think we've said this before. You don't drive, we, some of us don't drive cars that old. That's considered an antique. So, you know, so their push is going to be, and you can go to the Windows 7 and the Lifecycle page to see this. It's public info. They are working to tell people the better experience here is going to be buy a new computer, get Windows 10 on that, and you'll be moving forward. And you get to take advantage of new hardware, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, that, you know, and after, I, we understand that. After 10 years, you kind of go yeah. like, hey, guys, you know, kind of time to move on. But not, it doesn't sound like every consumer is going to feel that way. I mean. No, they won't. There, I think there's going to be some backlash. You've been tracking the Windows 7 end of life, uh, uh, not to bring it up again, but via Twitter and some other things. We are, as we get to the countdown, you know, we're what, nine months kind of out? Yeah, at this point? Nine, 10 let's months? see, late March, so April. So yeah, we're in that ballpark of until January 14th, do you, do you think? Do you think, so when we get there, it's not like Windows 7 is going to stop working, right? So people No, no, it's while, still going to work. Yeah, right. here's, not, here's the thing. Yeah. On the 14th of January, it's Patch Tuesday. They're going to issue the last set of patches, public patches for Windows 7 on that day. That means in February, there won't be any patches for Windows 7 unless you're a commercial entity or a business and you have paid for extended security updates. And that has it 
I think it starts, it depends on what you are on enterprise or Windows 7. The And each year they're available for three years and each year that price doubles. So I, it, enterprise starts at $25 a, a unit per device. And I think Pro is at 50. So it starts a little more expensive on the Pro side, right? Compared to enterprise. Mm -hmm. So in year two, that device now costs you $50 for enterprise for the extended security updates. And the other one has bounced up to 100. And then in the third year, it's basically triple what you started at. So you got 150 and 200. So the, the consumers, that's not an option, right? right. The consumers don't get these updates. So can a consumer stay on Windows 7 after 14 January and, and be okay? Yeah, for a while, because basically until that next vulnerability pops and there's no patch for it. And the other thing I don't think Microsoft's going to do is they're not going to extend the coverage. They're not going to extend Windows 7. They did that with XP, remember? XP got an extra two years. Now, the, 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 the numbers are going in the right direction, right? Uh, Windows 7 usage is going down. Windows 10 is going up. So things are moving in the right direction. Uh, I think we'll see a huge push. Microsoft's doing everything they can to get businesses and enterprises to shift. They're offering the uh, App Assure for free if you're, you know, they'll fix a uh, line of business app to work with Windows 10 if it's not working at no cost. And so that's a plus. That's a big deal for a company. Um, and so, yeah, it, you know, when you look at the enterprise size, they have options, but it's an expensive option. However, Preview just started last week for Windows Virtual Desktop, right, coming off of Azure. They announced this at Ignite last year. Uh, it's a Windows 10 multi-session virtual desktop. Uh, some people want to use VDI to compare it and things like that, but it's basically a virtual desktop that you get off of Azure that serves up to your workstation. Mm -hmm. It's multi-session, so that means more than one person can be logged into that OS instance at one time. It also supports Windows 7, and Windows 7 will get the three years of extended security updates if you use it through that service. Mm -hmm. So you don't pay extra for that, but you'd pay your compute time and cost to yeah. Azure yeah, and yeah, things you know. like that. I use so, that when, when I was an MVP, I would use yep. my dollars. We got $150 on Azure every month, and I would yep. I spun up several Windows 10 instances to run on that, oh, 28 to 50 bucks a month. Yep. And you kind of go, well, that's kind of expensive. Well, but you're not owning the equipment. When you're Correct. done, you shut it off. You shut and it off. Yeah. You can you can kind of size how big you want your drive. Do you need small drives just enough to run Windows and get an instance out there? Or if you need bigger space, you pay for it. You kind of pay for what you need. Um, Rich, I've got a Windows 7 Media Center sitting right, right behind, not behind me, but in the next room. My wife is watching TV on it right yep. now. For a person who's maybe running Media Center, there's like five of us left in the world. Right. But like, do I even, should I even, like, it, the, the use case is if I'm really not using my box to to get on the internet or to use those kinds of things, if it's just watching TV, I could let that Windows 7 instance yeah. roll for a while. I, I right? would think so. Yeah. And again, is it connected to the internet at all? Uh, it is definitely connected to the internet. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. so it's yeah. still out there. It's right. still right. online. Right. Um, you know, you could shift your usage pattern and uh, I mean, do you, do we do never media center, do rarely you stream go to the stuff web. down? Uh, it's all windows media center. So it's all. But, so where are the content? Where's the content located at though? Well, it's On located locally. No, oh, it's local. It's okay. It's so local. it's within the house. It's recorded. So you media could center. technically, you'd want to keep, you could disable the online aspect. Good. And keep the you know the home network piece working. We we block it pretty solidly. I've got a bit defender yeah. box. It's pretty can it's okay. pretty def, you know it's pretty protected at that as, as far as that goes. You know we well, I've been having this debate with with my wife with Sarah of like, hey okay so yeah I know the guide data still works but we're gonna have to get rid of this thing like seven yeah. is up next year. I've been trying you know different solutions. What do you replace it with? I don't know. We've tried Plex, so we've right. spent some time. I went to YouTube TV, gave that a try, 40 bucks a month to get everything, basically. Actually, that's a really sick, that's a really sick and slick um, solution. That that thing um, tends to work out uh, really, really well. We're doing all the same things of Netflix, Hulu, Prime. Right. You know, we've got all those things. You do that, Spotify? We do not. We are not ah, Spotify. Because Spotify customers. now Amazon. has added the Hulu subscription. Mm -hmm. at no well, we're Sprint provide Sprint provides okay. our cell phones. They also provide Hulu. So kind of right. Hulu partnered with and a I bunch of Netflix people. And I get Netflix from T-Mobile. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so 
you know, you start thinking about it. Prime, stuff comes through Prime. We get our music through Prime. So, you right. know, we're on those things already. Um, Joe, Joe just said in the chat room, and I had I 8.1 has Media Center. Uh, you Okay, so you could, there was a Media Center version that you could okay. have upgraded to okay. during those days. Uh, I'm not, not sure you could get there today. Like that, may, gotcha. maybe. I mean, if you're smart enough That'd and you got all the right stuff. Certainly, because 8.1 is still under support. Yeah. So, and it will be for, I guess oh. it's not quite at the end of its mainstream support right now. It's first no. five years. No. Could you imagine, Rich, going back to Windows 8? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I I have a, an instance of Windows 8 in a VM on my main desktop that I use for reference. So if I want to go and see something or look at something from yeah. back in those days, it still runs, you know, fine. It gets its updates and things of that nature. But uh, 2024, Brian. Yeah. So, yeah, there you go. 2024. That's so it's another five years. So it's right there and it's mm -hmm. it's about to enter into its extended support. Uh, yeah, so I still wouldn't years. do it. I I, 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 even if I I'm could, I wouldn't. Kidding. You know, I think I have a tablet here somewhere that's still running 8.1 on it. If it even takes a charge anymore, my RT won't take a charge anymore. My Surface 2 won't take a charge. So, so I've, just I've got my up. RT on my desktop. It's my weather machine. Uh, it it it's always got the weather. It's, it has to stay. I mean, I, I don't know if I can it has get it to stay up. plugged in, right? I, no I do batteries. have to. Yeah, yeah I can't. As soon boat, as you I could turn RT into a similar device. I hadn't thought yeah. about that. But. Yeah, no, it sits right on the desk during the winter. Um, it makes you know a super good. And you know what's amazing to me is I'm still are still shipping updates for it. Uh, well, it's eight point one, so it's yeah. still yeah, it's still a supported yeah, OS. It's not the yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, I just I'm yeah. amazed by it. it's not even eight. I mean, it is eight point one. It's a different version of eight point one. Well, it's you got RT. You get yeah. yeah. You gotta wonder like who who's the support team at Microsoft that? Well, I can't imagine they're taking a lot of phone calls. No, <laughs> they're probably just converting the patches that are being done for you know other instances of what I don't even know what usage is for eight point one right now. I think it's less than five percent. Nobody we. 8.1 was never really taken on by, right. by most. No, so. no, everybody, every, everybody skipped that. I just can't imagine that is mo the most um, engaging job at Microsoft. Like, Hey, what do you work on? Oh, I develop windows RT, you know, eight windows, eight RT patches. Yeah. Oh, don't forget. They build no. that for the OS straight line no. OS and they just have to build it to go on an RT device. Yeah. So it's yeah. pretty much the same patch. Did you get a chance? So have you gotten a chance to look at any of the HoloLens or was was any of those? I did. Or... I tried hard. Uh, I worked with my uh, PR contacts when I, because I went out to Microsoft a week early uh, so I could possibly do some product team stuff for work and unfortunately wasn't able. To, they are in high demand apparently and they're floating around the country doing demos for various people and stuff like that. I did hear that during during summit that some folks got some hands-on time with them uh on the extra days you know after summit mm -hmm. um and you know they look impressive i mean it really does compared i'm really itching to try it because i i spent some time in hololens you know the og the original version and i i'm really intrigued by two uh so i'm looking for i suspect that build in may uh there will probably be demos on the floor because they did the same thing after they went public with hololens they had you know demo stations so i suspect that at that there'll be an opportunity to get my head inside of a set i'm looking forward to it any um you know i was i've been using azure for a long time not mm -hmm. as much now i lost my mvp privileges it gets a little expensive um, to do it that way but um any um besides some of the services that are coming for a virtual desktop, which it, I, don't, I don't know why it's taken so long. I was doing that on Azure a long time ago to go to kind of go GA or for the publics to use it. But anything else announced Azure wise that Not you that saw? I, I mean, there's there's a lot of other stuff going on around Azure and things like that. I, I don't track that as much these days because it's not my beat. Uh, we have somebody else that does the cloud stuff and compute stuff. But it, this is significant and on my radar because of what it brings. You know, it introduces, and I, I had a demo of this at, at Ignite last year. They showed me the app that's virtualized, uh, basic. So they had a normal Windows 10 device. It was, and it was accessing a Windows 10 virtual desktop in Azure and serving an app to that normal Windows 10. So the app was basically being remoted off of the, Windows Virtual Desktop sitting on Azure when they were testing. It was part of the OS. It, it had an icon on the taskbar. They opened it. It opened like any other app did. 
and they were able to, and basically though it was coming out of the cloud. So it was pretty impressive that the app integration and then the full blown desktop is big deal because it's multi session. So multiple used to be, you couldn't do that. You couldn't have an instance of the OS and have more than one person using it because of licensing stuff. Mm -hmm. They changed that. They changed the licensing for the windows virtual desktop. And then the benefit of windows seven. So if you're a company out there and you've got, you know, three or four or five devices, maybe that you can't just quite get off windows seven for whatever reason. And you're on Azure as a customer already, you have to look at the, you know, the cost aspect and is it worth it to, to pick it up there until you can get it moved mm -hmm. or take advantage of Microsoft service like app Assure, where they'll actually set, they will assign someone, an engineer to you to work that issue until it's solved at no extra cost. Yeah. You know, I wonder if there's a use case as we as we think about, uh, you know, this having a virtual machine available to you in the cloud of really, we've talked about this before, but on the edge really being light and, and you know, battery efficient. And then when you need to do your whatever heavy computing, whatever that is, and, and I, I sometimes wonder how much heavy computing do we actually need to do? You and I are podcasters, so that's mm -hmm. a little different, right? We are constantly editing video or rendering it, you know, we're running all these things. I'm not sure that's necessarily anything I would I'd want to try and do in the cloud, although yeah. I tried to do it a couple times, a couple years ago, wasn't ready for it yet. That may be different now, but that edge device. So pay for a device you're only using. So you, you, you know, you're doing some things, web browsing, all that other stuff, light stuff you're doing like, okay, I need it. I need a little more horsepower, fire up the VM, turn it on, do, do its thing. Do you think there's a use case for that in the future here where we shift the heavier stuff to, to, you know, to the cloud? Here's all I got to say to that project X cloud, Microsoft's game streaming service that they're already putting blades into the data centers that are basically Xbox one X's. Mm -hmm. And then you have project Stadia, Stadia, however, Google. I think, I think it's Stadia. I think okay. It's yeah. So you have their cloud streaming and, uh, that the intent there is that the heavy computing is done in the cloud and then you get the stream of the interaction. So they, they've apparently dealt with the lag and latency and things of that nature. I want to see it. I want to really see this. And I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be June is E3, right? Mm -hmm. So beginning of June. So it'll be post build. Maybe they'll show off some of this at build. I don't know. Um, but so it'll be June at E3 in Los Angeles where they'll, Microsoft is going to do the big announcement around Project X Cloud. Yeah. I've talked to people who used Google's, what it wasn't called Stadia at the time, but they used it during the demo, basically streaming, a, was it Assassin's Creed Odyssey in their browser? And they said it was an experience as if they were on the console. Yeah. So. Well, so do you think for most people, like their heavy computing is gaming? You know, for, for, for some, for a lot of people, for most, it will be. Think? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know about most. Yeah, I, okay. You know, how many people are out there running massive access databases on their local network? Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> I do too. Uh, or big spreadsheets, big yeah. Excel spreadsheets and stuff like that. So when we talk heavy duty computing, I think most of the computing most of us do is not that, that weight, you know, because when you're talking about processing algorithms and AI and machine learning and stuff like that, now you're into some serious heavy lifting type stuff. Microsoft and probably Google too has figured out how to do that and then get those results. I, at CES, I, I didn't go this year. So last year I met a company that actually put the chip for all the local, for processing the AI, ML, all the stuff for their phone on the device as a, you know, so, the, so the data just had to get there and then it got crunched right there on the device. So they kind of flipped the board there, right? They put the, the capability into the phone. I, I think I think this is the serious kind of where it's headed. Mm -hmm. You know, are we still going to need local storage, local machines and screens to look through? Yeah, I, that's why Windows isn't going anywhere. There's a lot of people out there saying Windows will be dead in 10 years. It's not going to happen. When You still got to have a device to do it. Now, that could very well be what we thought at one point thin devices was going to be the thing mm -hmm. uh, just to be able to run a remote OS or something. Oh, your like phone, that. right? Oh, ultimately, yeah. your phone would be the thin client. So yep. <laughs> that's what we called them back in they the day. tried it with Continuum, right? With Windows Phone and Windows 10 Mobile. Yeah. Uh, what is it on Samsung? They call it DAX, I think, or something like that. Um, so that people are out there playing with it and experimenting with it.
So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I, I would, um, you know, at work, I'm constantly opening and closing my laptop as I go to and from meetings and opening it back up and you got to sign back in. Yep. I would really love to get to a lighter device that was instant boot that would then just go right to a go to a VM for me. And, yep. and it doesn't even need to be that powerful, but I don't want to have to reset that screen every time I, you know, every time I open or close the desktop, when I get into my office, it, it, it automatically goes two screens. I got access to the, um, to that compute speed, um, which I kind of need. So not, not just from a, uh, the ability to have more compute, but to keep my depth, my desktop ready and consistent, mm -hmm. You know, you close that lid or it shuts off or you run out of battery, you lose that. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to get away from that, just to be honest, get away from it completely and always be connecting to a VM somewhere. More power, more resources. It can be managed better. I can take advantage of, of more RAM if I need it or more right. hard drive space if I need it. It can be allocated quicker. Yep. You know, you can have those set in Azure. You can have it set to auto expand. Yep. You just pay for what you use. So... Um, yeah, I don't know. That seems that to me, that seems super attractive, uh, to, to and, have and they're trying to build the machines for that, right? They're, they're still working on these Snapdragon based windows devices that are based on Snapdragon arm basically. And so those are instant on those are long life battery. So, th so the devices are being, we've kind of gone into a quiet period, right? There's not been a, last year. We had a lot of talk about those in the fall and it's kind of gone silent. Now I suspect Maybe at build, I thought this was going to happen last year at build, but maybe this year is the year because there is some rumor bouncing around that I've read online uh, back when Twitter was available to me um, <laughs> that we're supposedly going to hear about this Windows Core OS at build. So there's some folks that believe we're going to hear about this. And so this is that light, right? Windows light, L-I-T or however you want to spell it. Mm -hmm. So it's possible if that's what we hear about at build, that means that the market, the, the hardware is starting to come along that's going to enable those types of devices. Again, like you're talking about, lightweight, good battery life, quick on, quick off, you know, that kind of stuff. And then yeah. your heavy lifting, there's options there. Obviously, it'll be an OS there. For the 99% of normal users, that's going to be more than enough power. It's it, And then you have, you know, the people who need to do the heavy duty stuff anyway, you know, universities, colleges, whoever that might be that are crunching numbers or AI or ML, they'll have access to that kind of framework as well. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want, I don't want my, um, um, I don't want my form factor to change. Like I want, like I want a full size keyboard. Yep. Like people are like, Oh, you go a tablet. No, 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 no. I still want to carry a full size keyboard with me with a screen that I access. I don't want to change that. I just want the compute to move either into the cloud yeah. or move into my data center where I know like, you know, so I'm in the building. I listen, I spend 95% of my work at work. I mean, I'm in the building all the time. Right. So for me, it could be local. It could be on Azure. I have a great internet connection. Somebody was saying in the chat room, you know, yeah, about the, the problem it is with that, issue. right? No, totally yeah. is. But I do work in a high speed environment. And, and for me, it would be, I think really helpful, beneficial to push that compute for most of it, push that compute into a, a state that I can just quickly log into and use. And I, I almost couldn't even tell. I mean, I use a lot of remote desktop here. I've got seven PCs running in this space right here. Mm -hmm. I don't go to them to use them. Right. I just bring right. them up as an instance on my desktop, right? Yep. And and use them that way. So I like to see, I kind of like to see that. Uh, I would like to see that change happen uh, kind of yep. sooner than later. Um. Let's talk a little space. I didn't tell you we we're going to talk about this, but okay. I always I always have to talk a little bit of space with you because you're like in the mecca yeah. of space. I mean, some great stuff is going on. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't think you think I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Boeing has had a lot of trouble with their with their Max Eight and Max yeah. Nine aircraft. They this summer are getting ready to launch one of their first spacecraft off the back of one of their planes. Do you think this is going? Did you know that? Mm -mm. Yeah, so Boeing Boeing's um, uh, play in space is to fly. Oh, yeah, okay. To, they attempted this launch either earlier this year or late last year, and it got scrubbed. It was yep. going to launch from Canaveral. They were going to take off from the shuttle landing facility. The rocket was basically – it's not a MAX that's right. carrying no, the rocket. Right, no, 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 correct. 
And yeah, yeah. so they they were going to strap the rocket underneath the airplane, go up to altitude and launch it yeah. or drop it and then allow the engines to continue. So it kind of takes some of the work, the initial heavy lifting out of the process. Yeah. So, yeah, no. And there's other companies that uh, there's what is the other company that does? I mean, I guess you could compare it a little bit to Virgin Galactic mm -hmm. in the way they carry their spaceship up with the I forget what they call the airplane, but they carry it up to uh, like 40,000 feet and then release it and it fires its rocket engine and it goes. So it, it's a similar idea. This one was going to be, I, I forget what the mission was. There, there was a NASA social going on. So it got, they kept, they got scrubbed a couple of times due to weather, I think, and they just have now postponed it. Um, and so I don't, I, it's, it's just another way to get a rocket up into the yeah. air. Well, There's a lot think, going on down here though. We got think, Blue Origin has opened up right. a manufacturing facility down in the space coast, you know, Prior to shuttle going away, a couple of years into shuttle going away, the third party stuff was already shutting down. And so things were getting kind of deserted down there. You go down, I went down uh, a few weeks ago for uh, the Falcon first crew launch of Dragon, right? Uncrewed, but it was the crewed version of Dragon. And it, it's bustling now. There's lots going on down there. There's people, you know, the Blue Origin has come in. Another one has just broken ground, Space Ventures or something like that. So they're building rockets. They're going to build them out of a 3D printed material. So like carbon fiber type stuff. And then, of course, you got SpaceX doing what they're doing. I was on a social with NASA about two and a half weeks ago, the moon to Mars, right? That Monday when the, they announced their 2020 budget stuff. And so we were on we were on Kennedy. They took us up onto Launch Complex 39B, one of the sh old shuttle Apollo la uh, launch pads. Yeah. And we got to see the work they're doing to redesign it. They built a new flame trench. They built this movable device that can be moved based on the rocket to deflect the exhaust and stuff like that. So it was kind of cool to be up on top of the launch. And we got the normal kind of tour of, of VAB and and other things like that. They're ex they're busy down there. They've opened up buildings to handle stuff for SLS that were closed down after shuttle. So they've opened up where they put together the segments of the, the solid rocket boosters that they're going to use on SLS, same ones that were used on shuttle. They, they've opened that building back up and they're training and they're practicing to stack these elements on top of each other the way they'll do for the live stuff. So they're really excited down there. Yeah. Uh, what's going on? Well, it makes living down there pretty interesting, right? Well, because you're not far from a launch and they're doing quite hours. a few, quite a few, quite often, right? Well, we're looking next month. We've got a cargo resupply SpaceX Falcon 9 going uh, and Falcon Heavy. It looks like they have cut out a piece of time on the range, on the, the Atlantic range to launch Falcon Heavy. It's going to launch some satellites, some communication satellite. But so we've got the second launch of Falcon Heavy. This one won't have a car in it. But, you know, I, I, I'll i be if it's at the right timing, I'll be down there yeah. somewhere nearby yeah. to watch that Falcon Heavy. Well, I've just been, it's because Boeing is making a real run at this in an alternative way, right? We've, uh, SpaceX has certainly got the majority of the press. They're the darlings right now right. of space, right? Blue Origin, some others that are, they're doing things too. But it, it was just really interesting at the end of, oh, I was watching, maybe it was, maybe it was when the SpaceX vehicle was coming back from the um, space station. Oh, and, the crude one, right? The, yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Splash down in the Atlantic. And um, and so when that was on its way back, they were mentioning Boeing was going to launch this uh, later on the summer that they were going to try this this new way of doing. It. And then, of course, they have had nothing like I don't know how I, it'll be interesting to see if they how they survive yeah. these last two. And can they get this piece right? And, you know, you think, well, OK, that affects the airlines. No, I think there's actually a, if they're not going to launch it with this vehicle. But do you? Do you really want to launch a test vehicle and have something go wrong with it? Yeah, no. After optics. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't. And uh, like I said, they're already dealing with enough bad press because of the issues around the Max and that the safety software and alerts and sensors weren't part of the normal, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah, they've got issues on their hands. And yeah. oh, by the way, Boeing is working on CST 100, which is their version of a manned crew capsule that will. And I thought we were going to see it go up unmanned this year, but I guess that's going to push maybe into 2020. They are going to launch that on a ULA, a United Launch Alliance, Delta Four, I think, is what it'll go up on. Mm -hmm. So it'll go, it'll be, you know, Boeing's, that's commercial company, then ULA will do the the rocket piece yeah. for them. And ULA is yeah. an extremely reliable 
launch. Yeah, they launch a lot of those. Yeah. That's they've been going up. I think a lot, of mili- a lot of military stuff, up. right? I think is yep. what and they, they do some commercial stuff. What they've been doing. Um, it is like uh, sometimes I thought when I was a kid I missed the golden age of space uh, because of the Apollo missions and they ended in the seventies and I think we missed it. I think you can't. You got to pay attention right now. Like yep. I, I think you need to pay attention to what's going on. It has never been cooler. And some of those space programs, like there is a whole new and with and with competition. I don't know if it'll be safer, but there's a lot more stuff going on and a lot of really cool stuff happening. Yeah. And I just think space is the thing to watch. It's yeah. it's pretty we, incredible. We got to see Boeing's work on there right now. NASA has a couple different companies working on habitats for the lunar gateway, which was something they announced at this event that I was at. So this lunar gateway will be, will be basically a, a crew dragon or, uh, uh, the Orion. It'll be Orion. It'll be NASA's crewed vehicle. And I mean, they're doing some cool stuff. They're using old logistics modules that were used to take stuff up to the station. Well, this one was built for it, but never went to space. Uh, Donatello it's called. So you had Donatello, Raffaello, and I forget the other one. The other one is actually part of station now. They refurbed it and made it a space to attach to station on the last shuttle flight or next to last. So they're doing some cool stuff down there. And this whole, you, if you heard this past week, there was a speech given in five years. NASA has been challenged to get astronauts back on the moon within five years. Wow. So, yeah. Well, and the, the whole thought of the moon, right, is a jumping off point it's a so, point it's a stopping point it's not a permanent destination right. yeah. go up get them get it's yep. a refueling it's a gets and it's a lot easier to go come into go, and come oh, by and go. the way you can test all the technology you need to do on mars at the moon but be within three days of the earth right that's the kind of yeah. idea there yeah no super cool I, I i just don't ever get sick of it i think nope. there's just some great stuff coming with space you're in uh, not me, but you're in the ultimate spot for space to actually go, go out and watch it. By the I way, walk out of my if, front door. Yep. If you're not, we should remind you, observe, uh, if you're not listening to to Windows Observer, the Zerg Tech podcast that Rich does, he talks about these things that he gets to go out to do and in, in around space. So make sure you get subscribed to his podcast um, as well. Okay, let's talk. We got Windows 10, uh, 19 uh, H1, right? Yep. Uh, that is imminent. We don't know. We we think we're pretty close, right? Yeah. You know, here we are. It's the 28th of March. Uh, So 19H1 has been in development. I went back and looked since July of last year. July was when they released the first skip ahead builds of this feature update while they were still finishing up the October 2018 update. Uh, We're somewhere along 36 or 37 build releases. For this cycle, that counts fast ring, skip ahead fast ring and slow ring. Right now, we set, it, w- it was an interesting day. What's today? Thursday, right? So mm-hmm. Tuesday, we would have over the last few weeks, we've been getting fast ring builds. So we didn't get a fast ring build. Uh, so where we stand right now, 18362 is in fast ring and it's in slow ring. However, there's I mentioned at the pre-show, there's a bit of an issue plaguing them right now. So if you had gotten 18356.16, so basically 18356 went to slow ring a couple of weeks ago. Microsoft serviced it twice, right, to make some patches to it. It took it to build 18356.16. When they released 18362 to fast ring last week, it won't upgrade. So there's a ton of people that can't upgrade from 56, 356.16 to 362, right, the, the latest slow ring build. Uh, Lots of input, lots of feedback, lots of upvotes over the course of the weekend. They figured out the issue. They know the problem. They're working on a fix. So right now, I can take a production machine, switch it to slow ring, and it will upgrade to 18362. No problem, unless you've, of course, got games on there, and then it's the anti-cheat software issue they have. But so they, they figured out the issue. I think here's where we stand. As soon as they get that patch, verified they're going to push that patch out to 18356.16 service it and then tell and then they have turned temporarily turned off the slow ring 18362 so because of the issue because otherwise it just cycle and cycle and cycle so i think once they service 18356 they'll push out 18362 once we know that that works and successful i think very quickly thereafter they'll push it to release preview and then from release preview, which is pretty much we're looking at 18362 as the release candidate, what we used to call a release candidate. I, they 
I know they want to put it in release preview because that expands the number of test devices on it. That's why slow ring is so important. Um, and then, you know, past history shows sometime around patch Tuesday in April, this will be released probably the week after. I would say based on the fact that we're here at the end of the month, we don't have that release preview build yet. Uh, Microsoft does not want a repeat of the October 2018 update. Mm -hmm. And so they got to have a winner here because this is a big deal. And so I think that's what will happen. I think they'll service it. We'll get 362 going into slow ring properly, and then they'll push down to release preview. And, and then we'll wait until they announce that it's coming out. Yeah, for We already have a good idea what features are included. Mm -hmm. If you go to um, – on Microsoft Docs, there is a page that is called uh, Flight Hub. So um, that's where they keep track of all the builds that are released for Windows 10 19 H1. And so on that Flight Hub page, there's actually a link, and I just want to get the name. So it's um, down towards the bottom of the screen, I think it is. Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm, it's loading really slow. Anyway, they already are, have been kind of summarizing the updates that have been pushed out to various builds over the course of the last six months working on this feature update. So you can go there and see there's a couple I'm really excited for. Windows Sandbox is one. That's this virtual kind of desktop of Windows 10 that you can use to uh, execute questionable software if you do that kind of work and things like that. Um, it's a it's a destructible environment, so the moment you close it, it's gone. That's the plus of that. It's kind of like Windows Defender Application Guard, right, in the browser, that you can go to a questionable website inside of Windows Defender Application Guard on Edge, and it will stay within that. It won't get outside that virtualized environment. That It's a sandbox, too, basically. And so the moment you hit X, all that's gone off your system, right? No leftovers, no remnants, none of that. It's sandbox a container. So it is using some of that technology to, to produce that virtual, because you do have to have virtual capabilities. So your machine's got to be able to do the, the virtual stuff, right? I think it's called Hyper-V is the setting in the BIOS. Mm -hmm. And then you got to turn it on and you got to, it's actually not installed by default. You have to go into features and turn it on. And it's a real easy thing. But um, so, and they're still refining it. There are some settings now. You can actually edit a file and create some settings to create a default environment when you open it up. Um, it's, um, it's, it, it's pretty slick. It's a little slow on my test devices. I can't wait to get it on my main desktop where I have 32 gig of RAM. Yeah, it's RAM you know, intensive for sure. It's very RAM intensive. Very RAM intensive. So, yeah. so if you need a safe environment to, to do some stuff, if you're a security researcher or something like that, this is where this really pays off. You can use that environment and not worry about the risk of it getting outside of that that box. So I, I think Windows sandboxes and there's a lot of other kind of tweaks and, you know, they've upgraded the font system and how you can. So a standard user can actually install fonts now with that admin permission on their own device, you know, and they've done a lot of that kind of tweaking stuff, the emojis and the, the accessibility, ease of access narrator. So there's a ton of those kind of the Windows light theme becomes official with this release. I fully expect this release to be called the April 2019 update. That's kind of the pattern they've established now. It's very clear when it came out, and you don't you don't have to get confused about it. Um, so so the big deal right now, the big waiting point is when is this? When are they going to service that slow ring build that won't upgrade to the current slow ring build? So once that happens, it, I had a discussion with somebody about this. Technically, they could go ahead and because normal production devices aren't seeing this issue. This issue is only on devices running 18356.16. So if if you are on a standard production 1809 machine, you can upgrade. I've done it. I upgraded Surface Laptop last week to 362 to go ahead and push that out and you know a bare metal device to slow ring. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're there. We're right on top of it. So yeah. they you know they have three significant issues pending. One is the green screen of death, uh, which is related to the gaming anti-cheat software. So if you install PUBG or Fortnite or something like that, I couldn't get Surface Book 2 upgraded. at my. I was on campus and couldn't get upgraded. I attempted over multiple times. And then during the session with the uh, flighting team, I actually had me a couple softies over my shoulder. We couldn't figure out why. It was given an alert but not populating the alert, right, to tell you what the issue was because I had uninstalled Fortnite 
and I thought got rid of the stuff. Turns out there's a subdirectory in another directory that the cheat software is in, and it's not cleaned off when you uninstall the game. That was blocking the install. The moment I found that, boom, got upgraded. So I, I, we're right there. So I, I, it's going to be a good release. I think it'll. I'm running it on multiple devices, and it's become really solid. I think. And of course, all the app updates that go around that, the inbox stuff and things of that nature. Rich, one of the features you've been talking a lot about on your podcast is this idea of res reserving disk space. Oh, reserve for the story. App. Yeah. Like this, I think this may be one of the best features coming because I run this, uh, the Insider program on two pretty low end, well, Surface Pro 3, not not yeah. that low end. It's How still storage on there. It's, it's, a, it's a Core i5. It's got 64 and it's got four gig of RAM, which I wish it had eight. I wish I had yeah. a bottle with the eight. Just yeah. it, in the day, four was plenty. It's, yeah, yeah. With Sandbox, it's not, right? But okay, so let's just say that still. So some pretty good storage. I run uh, it also on the Kangaroo because, which is a really small, really underpowered, does have four gig of RAM, but it's still super underpowered and very little space, 32 gig of RAM on that. And, yeah. or I'm sorry, yeah, 32 gig of hard drive space. And I wanted to know when they when they started announcing this reserved disk space, the whole idea was to change the whole upgrade experience to say, hey, look, we want to make it easier and better for these low end systems to be able to upgrade. And I was super skeptical. I wasn't sure if it was going to work or not. And uh, Flood Advisory just came in for me, by the way, on my weather, on my RT weather station <laughs> right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm in no problems here, but the city of Bellevue is struggling a little bit. But um, Rich, so far on the Kangaroo, the upgrade experience, oh, a year or two ago was pretty much bad to impossible. You would have to do these, these gyrations where you'd have to yep. make sure you deleted stuff and then you'd move stuff around and then you wouldn't have enough space. So it'd be like, hey, can we use your D drive? And you would put it, some stuff there and it was just, and then I think we'd get super hot and it was just terrible. Yep. I have now that we've started doing the reserve, and, and initially I think it started, you had to go into the registry and change did, something yeah. to get it going. And I think now it's a It's toggle. not automatic still. No, okay. there is okay. no toggle. Uh, and I talked to the program manager for reserve storage during Summit. Oh, that would have been and, great. I would have loved and, that conversation. And he, he did share that the way you activate this once 1903 comes out, you know, this upcoming update is a clean install. So on a clean install, it will be automatically triggered. So, uh, and then existing systems, they're not messing with those. They did it under Insider because they wanted to test the feature. Right, right. Uh, I'm sure there's still going to be a way to trigger it, right? To go, and I don't yeah. know if they're putting a button in the system or if it will be a, a, a registry edit like we had to do in December. I have two or three of those. I have two of those new vision, an eight inch and a 10 inch 32 gig tablet. So I intend, and those those last couple cycles upgrades have gotten better, but I don't use those daily, right? I don't have a lot on them. I don't use them a bunch. I just keep them upgraded to use them for reference. So it'll be interesting to see how devices like that. Now, I think we're starting to, you know, this is coming along, but I also think we're moving away from these low storage, low end form factors. So I, it may I be know. a solution that's coming to a problem late in the game. I, I'm not sure that's, totally true for uh it might be true for us in this in the first world but i oh, think there point. are still yeah. plenty of low-end devices especially yeah, right. 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 education and third world yep. that's a good uh, point so, so it's an interesting feature i've been tracking I, i've stopped tracking now i was tracking since december how much the space changed over each build subsequent build and things settled in pretty good everybody initially freaked out about seven gig you're going to take seven gig of my hard drive well, there's a good reason behind this feature. Yeah. And the intent is, is to prevent customers from hitting walls due to storage because the Windows 10 upgrade process for a feature update basically takes your existing installation. So your, uh, some of the program files and your data, and it moves it into a temporary directory. It's called windows.old in the root directory. And then they, they clean up and give you a fresh install of Windows 10, and then they migrate that data back in with your settings so that when you log on, boom, there you are the way you were. The problem would be is that that's a lot of data sometimes. You know, if you're using cloud storage consistently, it might not be as bad, but most people have issues around the amount, like you were saying, people have to go in and delete apps in order to yeah. make the install successful. They're yeah. trying to eliminate that pain. And so, they have, I think and, they have. It sounds like, it sounds, and again, yeah. I'm looking forward to the first cycle where I get that with the the feature turned on, especially on the small tablets, just yeah. to see. 
but it yeah. sounds like you've had that experience and it's working. No, kangaroo absolutely where it used to just be a nightmare. And, and by the way, Andrew reminded me that that's the kangaroo that the battery exploded on. I mean, it oh, didn't quite yeah. explode, but it did get, I'd made that kind of a mining machine and it was running 24 wow, seven, gotcha. not, not intended, not a good idea and yeah. not intended to run that off. And that battery yeah. got hot and really expanded. Uh, kangaroo was kind enough to replace and I've been using that. Um, I continue to use it as a Windows Insider box just for this purpose to yep. say, how so is Microsoft doing? Trigger, right? You flipped the bit in the mm -hmm. registry. I went and flipped the bit. Okay. Yeah. And have been monitoring it. Six to eight gig is yeah, kind of taking, ballpark. but changed that like that thing. I never have to worry about it upgrading. Now I go in there, pop in, set it, watch it as it does it. And it, it upgrades very smooth. So, I'm, what I'm imagining, Rich, is if they've gotten good at at that working well for crappy low-end devices, yeah. how much better should our upgrade experience be on powerful machines? It, so it should be the better. Surface Pro, the Surface Pro 3 uh, now is uh, is literally a few minutes now to upgrade these. I mean, uh, these upgrade cycles have gotten so good at this. This is one area, and I'm, and, you know, I'm not an, M I'm not an MVP anymore, so no uh, bias here. But I watch this thing. I'll get home, and it'll be like, hey, there's, you know, upgrade waiting for you. I'll start it, do a few other things, and come back, and it's done. Yeah. And so I do think now you mentioned this a little bit earlier. We have to. Microsoft has to have a really good, solid launch this time. Yeah. Two in a row has been bad. Do that. Well, right. they even had some issues last spring, remember? Yeah. So there was a yeah. couple little things, although it didn't cause them to pull it, then they had the really bad launch in September. Uh, just this week, they finally have declared that 1809 is ready for wide distribution and install upgrades. So Do, really I think most people are going to skip it, don't you think? I 1809? Think most, yeah. Well, well, think about it. Um, 1809, it has 30 months of support. So for a business or an enterprise, if they wait for 1903, 1903 only gets 18 months. Yeah. So in that case, you might see somebody. So if they're not on 1809, that means they're maybe on 1803. So 1803 only gets 18 months. So you're talking about this fall. So yeah, they could shoot for this fall and get to 30 months yeah. of support yeah. for the fall. That way. One more feature that uh, I think has been high profile is the separating of search and Cortana. So yeah. if you're on any build, any, any non-insider build, your Cortana search experience, I think a little one weird. At, yeah. One box. I think a little weird at first, but I think most users have grown to embrace it. It's not a feature that I heard people clamoring about. Like, this is so terrible. You have to get rid of it. I think Microsoft's got some other ideas for Cortana. And so yeah. I think pulling that out of search, you're going to see some new, um, when you click the search button, you're going to see a new UI as well, That's which right. is yeah. uh, programs you've been using, Top searches. Apps. Yeah. Top apps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They call it. Yeah, which I actually think is 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 more helpful. When I go, I use the, Rich. I use the heck out of Quick Search in my file explorer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm constantly, I yeah, I am constantly finding files and stuff. I mean, I spend most of my evenings and some of the crypto work that I do. I'm going in and getting past phrases, or I'm I'm documenting things, right? So I'm spending times in and out of these files. And Quick Quick uh, Quick Search um, has just been. Has, it's been amazing for me. It's so sped things up. Yep. I think in with this search change going, I think we're going to see a similar, it's going to take me a little bit of time to get used to that, but restarting those things or going to those, going to those programs, they were always there, by the way, they're on the start menu. So if you click start yeah. right there, there, yeah. um, but the, the UI layout is much more intuitive as I've been using that in, um, in the insider builds. And I think people need to give that a try when they get out. There. Uh, oh, by the way, under the hood, they, they have updated the indexing stuff. So part of the reason why you're getting a better experience is the, because the indexing has been approved in general for the OS. So it's in, it's more efficient in indexing. And so the search capability therefore becomes better because more things are indexed because it's able to do it quicker. Yeah. Yeah. No, right on. I, I, I think do. that's one of those under the hood changes yeah, yeah. that is going to be, again, it's very, very different when you click the search menu now and you see this completely different UI than we've ever seen before. Um, it's got the ability to do all or apps or documents or email or web, which by the way, mimics the store, right? It looks yeah. like the store which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. 
So, but very, very much simplified. But when you're looking at it, uh, like not mine, as I clicked on it, I have Edge, this macro recorder, settings, game bar, and file explorer. You can see what I use on that PC the most, right? right? right. Bringing those things forward. Um, I think that's going to be pretty handy. So as folks upgrade, most of the enthusiasts here aren't. I, I think most of my listeners are not in the Insider program, but they they will upgrade pretty fast right? Uh, when we get there. And so for me, for you, if you're upgrading, I think that's one of those things you kind of want to check out, to, you know, uh, check out that option. I wrote, you mentioned Sandbox. I actually wrote an article on how to upgrade Sandbox at TheAverageGuy.tv. So if you go to TheAverageGuy.tv, search Sandbox in there, and you'll see the article. Super you easy to get installed. File to no, no, no. This is, this is now the new setup within where you can go. You don't edit the file. You go into add features and oh, programs. Features. Oh, where you go in to install Sandboxes. Yeah, yeah. and you yeah. find Hyper-V. Click on it, add it. It does its thing. Super easy to do. It's been, uh, been, a, been a, if 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 and when in the next couple of weeks. By the time most people are listening to this, you're just a, you're a week or two, yep. I think away. I think for most, if you want it right away, just go, just keep yeah, refreshing. Seeker mode. They're going to do it like they have in the past. So seekers will be the first. So if you go push Windows Update or you can go download the media creation tool and things like that. So the it's going to initially come out for folks going and looking for it. Yeah. Rich, uh, looking ahead to the future, uh, kind of last question for you as we think about this, as you think about, you know, a uh, 20H1 is out. Uh, have you looked ahead or, or is anything you're looking forward to as far as what you know or some things that are, um, that are coming up? Yeah, I mean, all we have, um, Mary Jo Foley, I think, reported on this not long after. So basically what you're talking about is skip ahead at the end of 19H1 rather than going to 19H2, the second feature update for this year it went to 20 H1. Mary Jo Foley, Mary Jo Foley later reported that this was simply and purely that Microsoft, because Microsoft publicly said we have, we have more, we need more lead time for that OS release. It's related to Azure because they have specialized versions of Windows 10 running on Azure that are built for certain kind of activities in the cloud and Windows. So they got to incorporate that into 20 H1. So they need a longer lead time. Basically, right now, 20H1 has simply been mirroring 19H1 builds. So the you if you go and look at the list of fixes and known issues, it's almost mirror image of each other, right? And so they've basically been, as they patch things in 19H1, they've done it in 20H1, and we get a release for that every week. The interesting thing is going to be 19H2 because... Microsoft is going to take, so as we get to the end of 19H1, so we've been talking, we talked earlier about 18362 being current slow ring build. The goal, it obviously, since they haven't released a new fast ring build, their goal is to get 18362 into release preview so that that ultimately becomes the general availability build. Once that occurs, there'll be a brief opportunity for you if you're an insider and have a device on the insider that you can pull out of the program without having to reinstall the system, right? Because shortly afterwards, FastRing is going to start getting 19H2 builds. So that will be whatever the fall is going to be. I, I believe that it's not going to be as big of an upgrade. I think I think they're shifting focus maybe to stability, uniformity, UI cleanup, things of that nature, rather than adding a bunch of new features. Um, kind of a major minor feature update approach. Tick and talk. We, I, yeah, we don't know for sure. They, they're not t saying that. They're simply saying 20H1 came early to skip ahead because they needed a lead time. So that's all. And we didn't, you know, there, there, there was nothing said that would lead me to believe anything else. But I, I just, having watched Microsoft over the years, it, just something about 19H2 and the way they're approaching it just seems unique. So yeah. and we'll have to, we'll, maybe we'll find out in a few weeks. I think it's good to keep your eyes on it if you're not doing it. By the way, anybody can join the Insider Program. Yep. So if you want to jump in there and get that done, now wouldn't be too bad of a time to do it. No, because... slow ring builds are really stable. Yeah. I, I, Unfortunately, it's not going on my main desktop yet because I play Fortnite. So <laughs> yeah. that's not happening. But yeah. I've upgraded Surface Laptop, which was a production machine on 1809. It's run, not running Windows 10 S. I converted it to Pro a few months ago. So it's running on Surface Laptop with no problems. I think 362 is a great build to be the final build. And it'll probably have some kind of day one servicing update. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not a bad time to go in. If you're on production and you're ready to kind of dive in, this is a very stable build. 
you go join Insider, it defaults to slow ring if you choose active development of Windows. It doesn't default to fast, but fast ring is the same build, by the way. But it defaults to slow. You get the slow upgrade. You get the upgrade on your system. And then once it goes final, if it goes to release preview, you can you can then uh, you know move to release preview if you choose to. Or you could install 18362 and say, I don't want to be an insider anymore when the window opens. And then you'll get the normal production updates. Yeah. If you want to get it early, you could join now. Yep. Get, get a good look at it. Uh, see if you like it. If you stay on it, then, you know, you probably got a good month or two before the new fast ring builds start coming. By the way, I, I only recommend, I only recommend fast ring. Like slow ring is super boring. Yeah, okay. Slow ring. We didn't have any slow super ring boring. builds until four or five weeks yeah. ago. With yeah, this super cycle. boring. Just if you're going to test, I'm get on the fast you, ring. We will have the, here's my prediction. We will have the first fast ring build for 19H2 before the end of April. Hmm. I don't think they'll mess with, they'll, okay. they want to get those flowing. Get, get moving. Well, I think, and although the, my experience has been that even on the fast ring, they're not breaking things very often. So it, not, not really. No, no, it's fairly stable. I mean, there's a little weird oddities for it. Yep. The, uh, the doc you mentioned uh, that we were talking about, uh, what's new for Windows 10 Insider Preview Builds 19H1. I will put a link to that in the show notes. That will be one of the few notes that, that we have. It is actually packed full of all the all the updates that are coming. While this is not a major feature update, there is a ton of stuff coming in yep. this. And depending on how you use Windows, there may be some things in there for you. So oh, yeah. this this may be one of these times ahead of the upgrade to go did out there find and get familiar. Link to the actual features they've summarized? I did. Oh, yeah, perfect. I did. Yeah, yeah I that's threw, a I really that in the chat room. Document. That's a really in-depth document. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great way to kind of see what they've been working on and and what you can expect. Yeah. And, and somebody commented about emoji, you know, it, that we, we're at that point with Windows 10 where I'm not sure that there are these great whiz bang, big, big changing features anymore, right? Sandbox is a significant feature, I, um, you know, and from the perspective that they've pushed it out there and have it ready. Uh, is there anything else in there that's really like whiz bang huge? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, think, well, some of the things we talked about, like you said, reserve storage, we talked about. So yeah. a lot of under the hood stuff is going on yeah. and that, that makes for more stable. Like, by the way, I have recently started to uh, track the Windows 10 subreddit on reddit.com. It's an interesting perspective. I, I agree, Andrew, lack of bang is a good thing mm -hmm. because it means stable. It means mm -hmm. kind of consistent. They do have some stuff to clean up. And you know what, if they spent six months focusing on UI uh, you know, making it look nice, making it match, maybe getting rid of all the older stuff. You know, control panel is still a very dysfunctional existence right now between legacy and the new Windows settings app. Getting better. Getting better. Getting better every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, if, you know, what was I saying? Um, Sorry to throw you off on no, that. No, it's Andrew's fault because I saw his comment. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, so we're, we're kind of at that stage with this where, there aren't any of those big deals anymore. And I think that's not a bad thing for Microsoft. And if they spent the time to just focus on those things, I think it would be, a, oh, I was talking about the subreddit on Windows 10. Right. Let me tell you, the, it gives you as an enthusiast or as somebody as an advanced user, it gives you a new perspective on what people experience with Windows 10. There's a lot of vitriol and stuff like that that goes on in there too. You people just coming in and complaining about the, the simplest little things and sometimes real serious things. Um, and it's been a real, cause we can get in a bubble, right? We've talked about this tech bubble before. Yeah. And when a new feature is added to windows 10, such as an emoji picker and expands the available emoji, we're not the target audience. No. You know, it's it, during summit, uh, the surface Smiths, right? David Smith, Colin Smith did a, their hundredth show on the Wednesday afternoon, right? During summit, and they had Don on there and they were, the discussion was around what do you call those users? Me, I've always called them everyday users. Mm -hmm. and, you know, some people wanted to get semantic about every day, but they're the folks that use their computer like an appliance. You know, they wanted to be able to make toast when they want toast. So they go to it, they flip the button, they turn it on, they expect their desktop, desktop to be there. They want to see Facebook, email, you know, that kind of stuff. We're different. You know, you, me, everybody listening, everybody in the chat room are very different types of users. So a lot of the features that we're seeing and the fixes and things they tweaked in Windows 10 for the feature update that's coming 
has really been targeting those everyday users. They're not, they're not out for it. Windows Sandbox is. That's a cool feature, you know. There's another, oh, you asked me what I wanted to see in 20H1. I'll tell you what I want to see. I'm worried about Windows Virtual. I'm worried about, um, it, I think they call it Windows Virtual Desktop on the desktop, right? What do they call that? You know what I'm talking about? Mm -mm, mm -mm, uh, in no. task view. Uh, yeah, well, you know how you can go to task view and you can open up multiple desktops? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, I, I don't know if they call it virtual desktop, but because they're not virtual, but they're separate desktops. I, I have a concern about usage on that. And unfortunately in Windows, if a feature is not used much, it's a target for deprecation and being removed because it's not worth the investment. And so if they would spend a little bit of time on that feature and just do some simple things, make them configurable, let me save them, in it, save the instance of that desktop and I could set up one for work, one for play, one for, or one for work, one for personal, one for web browsing or, you know, whatever it is and save those things, not save states. Yeah. Yeah. No, not save states. Okay. Because that's what you use a virtual machine for. Right. Right. But these, these, these desktops are built to give you separate work environments on the same desktop. So if they would allow you to customize that and say, when I open desktop two, which I'm going to name Outlook, that's my Outlook email desktop. And then I'm going to open another one up for social media and save things. So when I open that one, I want you to open Twitter and X, Y, Z. So I'd like to see some work on that because I think it's a nifty feature, but they're just destructible right now. So they don't add much value. And unfortunately, I think that would indicate low usage and those are targets and those things yeah. will get wiped out of windows in a heartbeat. Yeah, I don't, I do not find any use in them today. That's just mm -hmm. that, um, the I'd timeline. I'd ra rather have the open windows on the taskbar. Yeah, timeline features have not really been oh, a factor. Yeah. Timeline for me. stuff for me is a okay. great feature. Yeah, no, it's good. Searching for past yeah. stuff that I've, I go, man, what was I looking at three days ago? Where was that thing? And then I can do a search typically. And again, because of the improvements in the indexing and stuff like that, that search is also a good experience. Yeah. Let me let me say one more thing before we wrap this uh -huh. about emojis and even about gifts, right? So we have moved, you know, we we make fun of these all the time in our bubble, right? It's kind of like, oh, right. come on, who's using this? We recently upgraded and have moved on to Microsoft Teams at work and have begun oh. using that. And big push to get away from email and get the conversations going in Teams, and especially for. This has become particularly um, important when you think about threaded conversations, right? Where you might have emails, people getting added and taken off and right. And, and Teams really does kind of solve that. I've been actually super impressed with how good Teams is out of the shoot. For podcasting, if we could get some things where it can be recorded like this, I'd move to Teams in a heartbeat. That experience is way better now than Google Hangouts. Okay, that being said, what I'm watching my millennial coworkers do, and these aren't these aren't 20 year old millennials. By the way, 20 year olds aren't millennials; they're Gen Z at this point. The millennials are all 30 and 40 at this point. Those millennials are gifting the crap out of Teams, <laughs> yeah. like and emojis as well. And that is part of the communication. Now, like it or not, guys, listen, I, listen, I know you're in your car. You're listening to me right now. You are screaming at me like, I will never accept emojis as a form of communication. Well, guess what? They are behind us and they are coming. And it is, it's funny, uh, Rich. I always thought emojis were stupid, but they do have, they're like hieroglyphics in a lot of ways. They have meanings to what, how the way people use them. They may be silly in a lot of cases. They may be awful in some, but there is, I've, I've gotten notes from people. I can't even decipher it, but it, they're like, they know what it means. They know exactly what it means. And my kids go, oh yeah, it says this. And I'm like, what? So anyways, that right or wrong, um, we, uh, today, what I'm seeing it work in teams, somebody will say something, four gifts show up, just Boom, boom, you know, somebody dancing, little messages, right? That has actually made its way to corporate culture and is acceptable. Yep. Yep. And so I think, well, depends on the corporate culture, whether it's acceptable or not. <laughs> In mine, it is right now, you know, and I don't know. With the teams that you work on virtually, Rich, do what, what are you guys using to connect or Slack. are you? Slack, okay. I have a perfectly matching Teams channel built. All, because we're an Office 365 shop with Informa. So I have built a Teams channel and site for us. 
and I've got everybody's accounts in there, everybody's folders, everybody's discussion board, all the, it's an exact duplicate of what we have on Slack. There's only five or six of us. I can't get them over there. Mm -hmm. I can't get them to move. Mm -hmm. So people still want to send me Google Docs to, to collaborate on. I don't do Google Docs. <laughs> well, I do because my editor does. Yeah, yeah, you, know you kind of have to. We're yeah. still, I st to be honest, 100% honest, uh, since show 100, we've been on Google Docs here for my stuff. It's the only place I use Google Docs for. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't share a lot of Docs. I mean, isn't Hangouts going away? Uh, so the consumer version of Hangouts, yes. Yeah. Okay. The uh, Hangouts are moving into their, G Suite, so it will it will continue to live in the right. and, 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 and then yeah. I think a version of it that we use now. This what we're using right now is not actually uh, it's not actually a Hangout per se. It's a YouTube on, live, oh, okay. and so I think they've just migrated the code over to YouTube. Oh, gotcha. Okay, and with the YouTube redesign now, you you access it through. I get this Hangout through YouTube now, not oh, okay. through Google Plus. Gotcha. Now. We're going to find out on April, April 1st, right? Something. Oh, yeah. Google Plus goes away. Like, yep. gone. Gandhi. Um, which is a good thing. But, I no, I think we're fine on this. Okay. This this works this way, by the way. I mean, this works great. I've been testing other options just in case other things happen. But, um, yeah, no, I, I've been surprised. Um, so, when we look at, you know, Emoji 12.0 and we're adding new emojis and we kind of go, you are, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Uh, no, 20 years behind us, it, they are speaking emoji and it's one of those kinds. And it, will it be a fad? Probably. They'll probably, there'll be something behind that, that the kids do. And they'll be like, why can't you? You know, the old people will be like, I don't know, emojis. I, I like emojis. Get off my emoji. So, um, I don't know. I think it's coming up. Yeah. Rich, thanks for. Oh yeah. It's great to have you great on to catch here. Up. Yeah, no, always great to catch up with you. Um, what's coming up for you? What kind of, what are you focusing on? What kind of things are happening in your world? Um, well, we, uh, obviously this, the, the release, the feature updates, a big deal because we do a big P I do a big piece on it for work for it pro today. Uh, focusing on the enterprise it pro kind of perspective of things. Um, you know, that this, we're at a point where it feels like, September, I think September was an anomaly with the this issue that they had from the perspective of it seems as if they've implemented some things quality control wise that I don't think we're going to have an issue. This thing that's happened in the slow ring is a minor issue in the scheme of things. Production machines can be upgraded. So, you know, for me, I'm watching this release, uh, watching what Microsoft does with it and how they move forward from it. Especially, like I said, we're really now in the post Terry Meyerson era. When this build comes out, this is the last feature update that has Terry Meyerson's fingerprints on it. Cause they plan these things out 12 to 18 months in advance, right? So this is the last, so the next feature update is the one that's got the fingers on it from the, the, the Scott Guthrie Azure organization, right? Yeah. And so we're with the new leadership and everything. So. I, I think paying attention to this next six months is a big deal because we're finally going to see what their perspective is and where they intend for, this is going to be our first real test of where is Windows headed? You know, are they going to continue to put their resources there and, and keep this Windows 10 thing rolling? And how are they going to approach it? You know, we've talked about it. I think there's real value in rather than doing a feature update, focusing on stability fixes, UI consistency, those kind of things, as opposed to, to adding a bunch of new features. And then, you know, you pick back up in the spring. And again, that spring release will be interesting. So the next big event for me is Build. I think Build's going to be interesting this year, with especially with the perspective of Windows Core. We've been talking about and hearing about Windows Core everywhere for, you know, a year now. Um, so I, Build is just, uh, let's see, seven weeks away. So that is the next big event on the Microsoft horizon. 
Uh, and then the only other thing I'll be watching for the next couple of days is do I get a Twitter account back? <laughs> that's, that's a whole long story. We, yeah, we're, we're going to here. Rich and I spent some time talking about it. Really, uh, you'll talk I'll about a post it. I'll report on it on my site. Yeah, yeah we'll, you'll, you'll uh, talk about it. There's already a story on windowsobserver.com around this suspension. This is not my first Twitter suspension, apparently. No, it is not. And no. uh, so I do have a bit of a kind of my own voice talking about why this happened and why I think it happened. And then they'll, I'll do a postmortem one way or the other. So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you've got somebody gunning for you, but (laughs) that, uh, that, that being said, we'll hope we get your, your Twitter, Twitter account. I think I saw Tony Rayner post something on Twitter during (laughs) Twitter lists. Um, Oh, by the way, I got a very nice, Oh. Samsung Gear S3 Frontier for what, like my 35th wedding anniversary on nice. Sunday for my wife. How much? It, if uh, I can ask. I it know it's a gift. 29, but... 229 at Best Buy. Well, that's not bad. So sell for 70 bucks off. Yeah. The Galaxy Watch is its follow-on. This was the predecessor to Galaxy Watch, which they launched with S10. Um, this is my first smartwatch since Band 2. So oh, it's wow. a whole new kind wow. of experience with it. Um, but so far... I like it. I really like it a lot. And dude, you can customize watch faces till you go blue in the face. It's pretty cool to be able to change the watch face. Yeah. Heart rate. Heart rate. It's got all the features of Samsung Health. So I got, it's got heart rate sensor. Um, It does obviously the exercise tracking, sleep tracking, things of that nature. So uh, I I have to to admit to you, Rich, when they made the announcement about the surface, no, when they made the announcement about the watch, what do we call it thing? The, what was the Microsoft watch? The band. There we band. go. Yeah. And it, I still had, it was like, as long as it's turned on before, what was the date? There was a date on this. Oh Fed- yeah. They did the thing. Yeah. You had to have actively synced it within the last, I think that date's passed now or maybe. Oh yeah. No, no, totally. I think it was like the end of the month or something. So you could feasibly, if it was still working and you synced recently, you could get a, a refund. So band two got like $175 and band one got a hundred or something like that. Yeah. Well, I I was within hours. The way I read it was if it was if it was synced before that date, yep, yep, you would be eligible. So, pulled that thing out of the drawer. I kind of forgot I had it. I pulled that thing out of the drawer, put the charger on it, fired right up, put the app on my phone. It connected right to it, and man, I I just I synced it as many times as I could. I was like, okay, we're gonna make it. I left it on all night. It's actually still sitting plugged in on top of my charger up there on the on the thing so you and, gotta file for, you have to go to well a, do you file the, that i couldn't page uh, if you if you go looking for it uh, in microsoft there was a and you know the typical sites covered this news so you'll find it on yeah. me or on microsoft or throt.com because and they they did give details about how if you had synced in that time frame well, how you approach getting the okay refund. i'll have to look that up because yeah, i yeah. I'm hoping I got it synced in there. That'd be kind of nice being, yep. you know, uh, being a, uh, being a user uh, of that for so long and having two of the bands go bad. I thought maybe I could get to get the hundred is it 175 bucks, which I is super generous. Two. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's what have. So, all right. So the verge story back in March real quick. Um, this was March 1st. So I'm thinking that that meant it had to be synced by the end of February. I think it did. There is, there is a link, um, for applying for a refund. It's, it's a support document. So basically, uh, and, and Jim, I'll pop this to you, this link to you in, uh, in messenger. Okay. And so basically it says on May 31st, they'll discontinue the health dashboard, the app will go away from store, Google Play, Apple App Store. Um, let's see. What happened? Da, 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 da. All right. So, uh, daggone, where'd it go? Eligibility for a refund. You have to have the band that's covered under its limited warranty, or you are an active user. An active user is defined as a user who has worn the band on their wrist and completed a data sync from the band to the health dashboard between December 1st and March 1st. I did it. I and did it on it. March 1st and hey, wore it. I put hey, it I put it on and for an hour. Is that a band two? The band two. 175 and band one is 79. Now what I couldn't figure out, apply for a refund. And so when I click on that link, so yeah, you go to, to that page. So you just found the page that I was reading to you from. Yep. 
and but I don't see a. It says refunds must be claimed by eight thirty. Yeah, but I but don't see where you go to. So I'm not where sure you, where that step goes, but yeah, uh, well, I'll have to figure. I have to figure it, that out. I know there's you know, a few of you. That was kind of out of the blue that they offered a refund for that device. I know. Yeah. So. No. Well, I. Uh, I. It, it's still in my Microsoft profile. It's still part of. I mean, it was still there. It says it's out of warranty, but. It, I could get it to connect to my, to the, you know, to the phone and up, update to the service. So it was a decent device. If that the bands had been better quality, that's the big issue. The bands kept breaking, wires were breaking inside the band, things like that. Yeah. So I, what I thought they would do is they would send emails to people who met that eligibility. There's yeah. got to be five of us, right? <laughs> Don't you think? Can't be that many who still have yeah. a band who are watching it on that day. I, so I don't know. I don't see a way um, today. I don't see a way to, to apply for that. Yeah. Right? I don't see anything in there either. It, and that support article went public, like right at the end of February. So yeah. 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 No, they literally, it was like 24 hours. Yeah. And I was, I saw it, I was reading the news on my phone and it was like Microsoft band something. I'm like, what? And so I clicked on it. So I raced down here and, and I'm like, okay, pull, pull it out. I, it was a miracle. One, I could find the band. Two, that I could find the charger for yep. it, right? Chargers were actually, I have two of them because they replaced they it. Strangely shaped thing. Yeah, too. yeah. Not not too different than the Apple Watch charger in the sense that it's a round, because of like a round disc. It would go on the end of the, um, it would go on the end of the, the, uh, the wristband. But I, which reminds me, I probably need to charge this thing. Um, I would, um, yeah, I had two of the chargers and I, they were in the box that, uh, they were in my recycle box, ready to go to Best Buy uh, to, for recycle. Right. So I pulled one out, threw it on the charger. I'm like, and then I put the band on, this is one of those nostalgic things. And I started going through it. Like, and I was like, this had so many oh, yeah. cool yeah. things on it. Right. And it had sensors that we're just getting now for the That's most right. part. And, and they are now kind of normal on smartwatches. Yeah. Microsoft was one of the first. No, it was stuff. a really good, it, it didn't fit well. Like it was not a good fitting watch. Not yeah. like your, not like your watch. No, yeah, no, not like my Apple it's watch. Pretty nice. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, pleased with this. I'm really excited about using this. Yeah. The, Rich, that Apple watch that I have fits so nicely and is so comfortable such a different experience on the band. So anyways, thanks for coming. Can you hang tight yep. for one, for me? For can, one second? Yep. Let me, let me, yep. let me close the show here. We want to thank everyone who supports the show via Patreon. If you're doing that, thank you for doing that Patreon. Uh, you can head out to the average guy.tv slash Patreon. If you want to join the crew, one in $5 plan, super simple to get it done for as for a month or for two or for 12, whatever you want to do. I wish I could say it was tax deductible, but it's not. We're a for-profit organization. And if you want to do that as well, head out to the averageguy.tv slash support or Patreon. We'll get you there as well. Don't forget to join the Discord group. Head out to the averageguy.tv slash Discord. If you want to contact the show, you can send me an email, jim at theaverageguy.tv. Find me, not to rub it in, find me on Twitter, yeah. Rich, <laughs> at Jay Collison is out there. Uh, make sure, when Rich, when your Twitter comes back, what are you at on Twitter? In OBS. With no and it is going to come back. We we are. We'll just be. We'll be positive about that. If you want to join the Facebook group, and I don't think anybody's going to join it now that we have a Discord group, but theaverageguy.tv uh, slash Facebook will get you there as well. Don't forget theaverageguy.tv, both web and media hosting, powered by Maple Grove Partners. Get secure, reliable, high speed hosting from those that you know and trust. Really well done WordPress instances designed and and optimized just for podcasters. Plans start at ten bucks. It's Christian. You know him. If you're interested and you want to look at the plans, maplegrovepartners.com. And then don't forget, you can get us on the app, uh, homegadgetgeeks.com, Android, iPhone, best way to listen on the road. Kevin was flying. I think that's how he I'm listened to it. airplane. No kidding. That's yeah, great. no. Streaming using uh, Spreaker's built-in app, which is super great. It's actually really, when I replace the live show with the recorded show, it automatically does it. No download. It's streaming only, but it's kind of designed for, kind of designed for that, and yeah. uh, and so we appreciate uh, you guys who support us on that um, as well. We're back uh, every Thursday, except next. I'm in New Orleans next week uh, at a conference, and so no live show and no recorded show. So take a week off. Go listen to Rich's podcast, 
and uh, you'll you'll want to catch up. I always, uh, Rich, thanks for you mentioned me on the show way more than you should, by the way. But I always listen to Rich at one point three speed, and I literally have to pause it and take a breath sometimes because yeah. Rich talks fast. Lots of materials in his podcast, lots of updates. You're like an Amazon flash briefing for for tech. That's what I like in the 30 minutes you're in there. I can kind of catch up on all because you don't go in depth on anything, but you get you, no. you cover the high I mean, level. It's, cover, a, a, it's kind of a hovering over the 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 news, I yeah. guess. Kind of. No, and and I like that. I know you've gotten some negative feedback on that because they don't you don't dig in. You've you've mentioned that before. I actually like it because I don't I don't want to dig in. You're the one you, you publish on Sundays. I pick it up Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. I know I can I can get through your podcast in about 35 minutes and it's going to get me everything I need to know for the week. Uh, everything that's happened in the last week. And because we're kind of in the same bubble here, yeah. in the same tech bubble, it's the things I'm interested in, <laughs> right? And so I think if you're listening to this and you haven't started listening to Rich's show, uh, go out there and get that subscribed to, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes if you uh, want an easy link to get it as well. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, we won't do much post show and no crypto this week, but that was a goodbye. Everybody.